For those of you who were worried, and you know who you are, that we would never get back to Peter, we are here. I know some of you are going, he's stopped Peter again. Somebody brought up the other day, you never even finished Hebrews. I'm going, I left the last verse off or something. It's okay. So, But last time we were talking about Peter, and it was before the holidays and the end of the year in, in those messages, is Peter was talking about humility. Let me, let me just go ahead and read it. I'm, I'll read what we're going to cover today and maybe a little bit of uh, a couple verses before that. Starting in verse, uh, well, I need bigger print now, 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. <clears throat> That's what we spent last time we were in Peter talking about is humility and casting our cares on Him uh, and our anxieties because He does care for us. And he says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And that's really all the further we're going to get today. So Peter's readers were suffering. They were either in persecution already in the throes of it or it was coming shortly or uh, if nothing else, just reading through the uh, the Gospels, you can understand that there were those that had suffered persecution, that Peter had seen um, killed and so forth. And one of the things he says to start off with is that we need to be sober-minded. And he picks the word carefully, and, and the word uh, means exactly what you would think it would mean, is that we're, we're not to be drunk, you know, we're not to be intoxicated. This is throughout the Scripture. You know, in Proverbs 21, it says, wine's a mocker. You know, strong drink is a brawler. You, you think you're going to get something from it that's going to bring you pleasure, whatever. And all it does is make fun of you and mock you and, and end up beating you up. And, you know, Proverbs 31, we go, yeah, that's a chapter about the, the, the wonderful woman. And it is, you know, it ends with, with the, the counsel about how to find a godly woman. But it starts off with, with the guy who's writing it and he's saying, these are the words I learned from my mother. And, and before he gets a couple verses into it, you know, she says to him, you know, it's not for you to drink wine, O king, <laughs> because if you do, you're going to forget what you decreed. It's not for you to do that. Be sober. Don't get your thoughts messed up. And I would throw in pot here as well. Sooner than later, we're going to be fighting that battle. There already are in multiple states. Uh, and if you don't know what that is, ask your parents. They can explain it to you later. But some of us grew up in that generation, and, and it's going to be the same issue Is you know, what are we supposed to do with this thing when it beats down our door? The principle is the same, is that we're not to be led astray. and We're not to become drunk. We're supposed to be sober-minded. We're supposed to be thinking properly. Uh, get a little Greeky here. I like some of this stuff. Maybe you do too. I don't know. If you don't, just zone out. But uh, when you look up the word sober-minded and in the first part of that sober, of course it means not to be drunk, but also free from illusion like that. We're not to have an illusion of what uh, life is like or the issues are like. We're to be free from the intoxicating influences of sin. You know, it promises us something and it always gives us something different. If you will go here, you will get this says the adulteress, or says the porn, or says whatever, the theft, the lie. And the truth is you're going to get something totally different than what's promised. It's an intoxicating lie. It says, refers to having the presence of mind, making clear judgment, enabling someone to be temperate, self-controlled, means to have one's wits about them, which is the opposite of being irrational. All of that's tied up in what Peter is starting this section out with, and he says, be sober-minded. Have your wits about you. Think properly. Don't be intoxicated by the illusions of sin and the deception of sin and so forth. Think clearly. <laughs> kind of get the idea of what, he, what he's saying to us. And he says, be sober-minded. And he says, be watchful. And, and this is the same word that he used earlier in uh, chapter 1 where he was talking about having our minds on the Lord and being totally focused on the Lord and keeping our gaze there, making sure we're, we're walking in obedience to His commands and walking in holiness and and it's the exact same word that he's using there. And now he says, look, you guys, be watchful. What does watchful mean? It means to stay awake, stay alert, be vigilant. Vigilant? Be reflective. Reflective. I used that not too long ago, didn't I? Where, where we were talking about making some time in our lives where we shut out the noise so we can think. <laughs> and we can think properly and clearly and soberly. And where we can actually get a view of what's going on without being all distorted and disturbed. We're to grow in our discernment. 
Isn't that a principle throughout Scripture? We're to grow in our discernment. Wherever we are today, we want to take steps to grow more and more in the gifts of the Spirit, fruits of the Spirit, understanding the things that are going on. And it starts up here. How we think. How we process things. How we process life's uh, issues that they throw at us. We'll get more to that in a minute. But he says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, prowls around. Now, I forget, and maybe you do too sometimes, that we really are in a battle. (laughs) That there really is a war going on. That we have an adversary. This term is a legal term. It's a term we could have our esteemed lawyer friend stand up and explain what what this means uh, legally. But when Peter was writing it, and you go to the Greek on it, and it says Satan is an adversary. He brings a lawsuit against the elect. He accuses them. You're familiar with that. Where he stands before the throne of God and he says, that guy deserves to go to hell because he's sinned and he's failed. And you know we have an advocate who stands up and says, that's true, but I paid that price. That's on me. And I'm so grateful for that. But we have, I love the way this, this put it in here, this said it, that's why I brought, put it in here. He said, we have an adversary who brings a lawsuit of darkness against believers. <laughs> he's, he's trying to bring darkness to us all the time, constantly, as our adversary. And he's trying to pull us down. He's seeking damages <laughs> against us. And sometimes I forget that. I forget that I'm in a war. And, and this is not unique to Peter. You, you look at... Um, Corinthians. Brian brought this up Wednesday night. You read through Corinthians and you'll run into this passage, 2 Corinthians, where he says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. We're not waging war? <laughs> Where'd that come from? I thought we were sitting around singing Kumbaya. You know, no. It, it, we're, we're not waging war in the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. And, and we forget that we are in a battle, that we're in a war. Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. We know these verses. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God. Wait, why do you need armor? (laughs) Why do we need armor? If we're not being attacked or in a battle or need protection. And he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. And he goes through and gives us lists of armor that we're supposed to put on. But the understanding is, is we're in a battle and we need it. And that's what Peter's reminding his readers. Look, guys, we're in a war. We're in a battle. You read Revelation, you go, where did all this start? How did all this happen? And and I don't have a clue. But you get to Revelation 12 and it says that there was this war in heaven. And Michael and his angels were warring against the devil and his angels. And he got thrown down to the earth. you know. And and then he's down here wreaking havoc everywhere, rampaging all over things. And it it makes for a good book. But it also, it, it makes us think, wait a minute, there really is a reality that I'm not aware of oftentimes, that I forget about. You read through the Scripture, and even a casual reading about it, you'll, you'll see where it says, hey, be careful. The devil can parade around as an angel of light. And he wants to deceive us. And he, and he says, don't get tied up in empty philosophies. And don't get outwitted by Satan's schemes. We sing, we're in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. You know, I'm in the Lord's army. What, what does that mean? That means we're in a battle. There is that understanding underneath it that we are in a battle. And that there is a war that goes on. And I forget that many, many times. And Peter is writing to his folks and he's saying, look guys, don't forget, you have an adversary. And your adversary, he's doing something. What's he doing? He's prowling around like a roaring lion. And what is his intent and purpose? Is he is looking to devour someone. That's fun, isn't it? There's only one purpose that a lion does prowling around is he's looking to eat something. (laughs) And usually it's a prey. And Peter is using this picture and he says, look guys, you have an adversary who hates you that wants to, literally it says devour, but what that word means is to swallow up, (laughs) to take captive, to destroy. And we go, well, that can't happen to believers. Really? 
I mean, the Bible refers to men and women all over the place that have been taken captive, that have been shipwrecked to their faith, that have wandered away, that have become deceived, that have blasphemed in this battle. If it isn't possible, my question is, why does Peter write the warning? Well, that's just hyperbole, really? You know, or, or that's just, he's just saying that because, you know, it, it could happen. It could, do you know anybody who has been devoured? <laughs> anybody who has been chewed on? Maybe you have. Maybe in your life. Maybe you've gone down a path that you had no business going down and you end up getting really beat up, <laughs> chewed on, entrapped, ensnared, devoured. <clears throat> there is hope. We know we win this battle. But Peter gives a warning on purpose. He says, be sober-minded. Be watchful. You have an adversary and he hates you and he wants to destroy you. Now, we're not supposed to live in fear. I understand that. And there's this tension between saying, oh my goodness, there's a devil and he hates me, and understanding whose child we are. But we're told not to be ignorant for a reason, so that we wouldn't be ignorant. <laughs> we're told to watch so that we would watch. We're told to be aware so we would be aware. Right? I mean, and what are we supposed to do with it? Well, he says, resist him. Resist him. Firm in your faith. Now, we're not going to win a hand-to-hand -hand battle with the devil. He's not God. We know that. There isn't this dualism where you have the good force and bad force, you know, and, you have, and, and they're duking it out in the cosmos. We know that's nonsense. And, but you and I are not going to do hand-to-hand -hand combat with the devil. For one thing, he's not of this world. He is ancient. He has been around doing this since I don't know how long. And he is an angel, or at least a fallen angel of some sort. Our power to fight Him comes in the ability to resist Him and His lies and deception. It's to take the lies that come and replace them with the truth of God's Word. And Peter says, look, resist Him. <laughs> resist Him. I don't want to offend anybody here. Why not? <laughs> you know, but uh, when I was young in the Lord, we had this practice of going around you know, binding and loosing the devil all the time, or binding the devil and loosing the Holy Spirit, I guess is what we were, we were trying to do. But it, it's loosely based on this passage that says whatever you bind on heaven will be bound on earth and so forth. But you, you're not going to find that principle in spiritual warfare where we go around and bind the devil. I mean, just a logical question here is, if he could be bound by us doing that, don't you think he would be by now? I mean, I'm just saying as many as millions of people that is, I bind you, devil. Are you, on what authority do we do that? I, I see in Jude where Michael's having a fuss with the devil over the body of Moses, and he says he doesn't bring a railing accusation. He doesn't say, I bind you. He says, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. And I'm going, man, we've we got to be careful. <laughs> the other thing is you can't bind your flesh. People come up to you and, oh, pastor, pray for me that I'll never lust again. Okay, I'm going to pray that you die. You know, because I, I, I can't cast that out of you. You know, cast that demon of lust out of me. No, what? I mean, come on. Okay, I'll stop. I'm... Resist means we... Here's what resist means. It, it, it's a military term meaning to take a stand. That's what resist means. You look up in the Greek and the underpinnings of that is that I am standing here. I got my sword and you're not getting this field of lentils. Philistines, remember that? One of the mighty men said he took a stand in a field, and he said, you're not getting this. That's what we're supposed to do. You read Ephesians 24, and the same word is used there where it says we don't give an opportunity to the devil. And what that means is we don't give him ground in our life. So people say, well, you know, click, you're a little weird. You don't, you don't like certain things, and you react to certain things, and like, you know, Ouija boards and seances and astrology, and you're just making a big deal out of nothing, and I'm going, no, I'm not. I don't want to give ground to the enemy in my life. I'm not going to play with that stuff. I'm not going to open up my heart or mind or life or spirit to that stuff. Why? Because I don't want the enemy to have a foot in my heart. When there's sin, I want to repent of it quickly. Yeah. When I'm in disobedience, God help me to move to obedience. Because I don't want to yield an inch to this foe and this adversary. He says, don't give him any ground. Resist him. Resist him. I mean, you read through the book of Acts and you run into these guys. It's just a couple little verses there. The, the sons of Sceva. Remember the sons of Sceva? 
You know, they're the ones that, that are, that are trying to do what the apostles are doing, which is casting out devils. And so they, you know, they dealing with this demon possessed guy and they said, you know, we cast you out in the name of, of Jesus or whatever, whatever they said exactly. And the demons answered him and said, we know Jesus and we know Paul and, and we know some of the other guys. Who are you? And they jump on him and beat him up. And you're going, you play around with things that you're not ready to play with. You're going to be in big trouble. And these guys were. They didn't have a relationship with the Lord. They didn't know the Lord. They didn't have any authority in the Lord. And they got beat up. So we are, we are told to resist. And specifically, we're told to resist, resist Him how? Firm in our faith. Now that's interesting to me. Why? Why firm in my faith? Well, we're not to resist in ourselves. We're not to resist in our intellect. We're not to resist in our abilities. We're not to resist in our ability to string sentences together so that it sounds good. We are to resist firm in our faith. We all have faith in something. In fact, you know, Peter or Paul said here, he said, look, in all circumstances, in all circumstances there, of course, means all circumstances, anything you can think of. He says, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith. You know? I got the shield of faith. I don't know if you can see it or not. There's little fiery darts bouncing off this, this shield. And we are to take up our faith when we resist the enemy. Why? What does that mean? What, what does faith mean? Well, faith we know is defined in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. I'm to take that up when the enemy is coming in and attacking and I'm supposed to stand firm. I'm supposed to say, you know, I may not understand this. I may not see it, but I've got tremendous hope in my God. And I know that things are going to work out and I'm resisting your lies, devil. <laughs> you know, everybody believes and trusts in something. You have a discussion with the most ardent atheist you can find. They believe in something. They believe in the uh, sovereignty of chance, for example. I mean, they have to, don't they? In the beginning were two dust particles. They're sovereign dust particles. And they crashed together and life came forth. Or, or maybe they believe in you know, the, the superiority of human advancement. They all believe in something. Some of them believe in aliens. We believe in the Heavenly Father who loves us. And He loved us so much that He sent His Son to save us. And He gave us the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us and explain His will to us and His Word to us and to be a guarantee and a down, po- a down payment of what is to come. <laughs> and He said, I'm going to give you my very Spirit and put them right inside of you because I've got such good things for you. You can't even imagine. But here's just a little taste. Yeah. We believe in that. We believe in the Word of God that's living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to divide between soul and spirit. We believe in these things. We believe that the Scripture deals with life to such an extent that it can give us direction and wisdom and guidance and clarity in anything. And we believe that, that the Word of God is true. And when the enemy comes in with the lies, we can say, yes, but the Word of God says this. And while your lie sounds enticing to me, this is true. And while there may be perverted truth in your lie, this is true without perversion. And I accept this. And so we resist the enemy with truth, with the Word of God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And without faith, it's impossible to resist the enemy. Now, the other thing that's interesting in this verse is he says, resist and firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. He ties (laughs) this battle to a key issue of suffering. It's one of the biggest lies that's out there is that suffering is a waste. (laughs) Many people who become ardent atheists become so because they go through a tragedy and a suffering that they cannot reconcile. Therefore, there cannot be a God is one of their conclusions. Instead of saying, I don't have enough information and I can't make make the connection or I don't see it all yet, they jump to the conclusion that says, because this is going on, there must not be a God. You know, that's a wrong conclusion. The right conclusion is is that suffering is not wasted. God uses suffering to do amazing things. I mean, we're praying for Daniel's brother. You know, what's God doing in that? More than we can imagine. 
I often think about Johnny Erickson, who I, I love her writing in her ministry. You know, it's been 40 years now, and she's reached millions, tens of millions of people with the power of the gospel, with hope and encouragement, and a message that's gone worldwide, and she's written books. I just read her, her new book here not too long ago, and it encouraged me so much. And I'm reading this, and I stop and think about it, and I'm going, if she wouldn't have broken her neck, would we even know the lady's name? Would we even know who she is? Probably not. God uses suffering. And he says, look, it's common. It's experienced by everybody throughout the world. And these guys are getting ready to, to go through some horrible things. And, and suffering in our lives can range from you know, discouragement, depression, to physical ailments that just won't stop, to out-and-out out persecution. And, and maybe we'll go through all of those things. But to think that it is wasted is a lie. Suffering chips away at our faith. Suffering is one of those arrows that come that we go, huh, I don't like this. And I'm not sure. I, I just don't know. I can't figure out what God's doing with this. And the answer is the same. We have got to have faith. We extinguish that lie with the shield of faith. I may not have all of the answers. And I've cried and prayed with a lot of you in here where, where something horrible is going on. I don't know the answers and I don't understand why, but I know God. And I know somehow, some way, God's going to redeem this thing. He's going to use it to further His work and His kingdom. Someday you'll turn around and help somebody else in their suffering. Just 2 Corinthians 1.5. You know, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who comforts us in our affliction. Why? So that we can turn around and comfort others in their affliction. And if for no other reason, at some point in time, we'll be able to help someone else. And I don't understand all of the reasons, but I know God. And we raise that shield of faith when suffering comes in. These guys are going to face the ultimate persecution, though many of them are going to suffer a martyr's death. And Peter's saying, man, your enemy wants to destroy you. You've got to have the shield of faith. You've got to believe that God is going to use this to further His kingdom and further His work. I know there's a reason that pain and suffering happens. We marvel at how much evil there is in the world. You know, suffering was unleashed because of the fall and because of sin. What we should be marveling at is how much goodness there is in the world. The fact that it's dominated by evil, wicked people, and yet there's so much good in the world still speaks to the testimony of a living God. And God's redemptive power. That's what we should be marveling at. We suffer for a reason. Job was mentioned earlier today, and he's in that book's in the Bible. It's the oldest book in the Bible, more than likely. And it's right there in the middle of it, and it's there for a reason. Here's a guy that doesn't have a clue what's going on. All of a sudden, whack, everything's gone out of his life. And in the midst of it, he maintains his integrity better than I probably would. And he says, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Though he slay me, I will love him and serve him. And I'm going, yeah, that's a shield of faith right there. Some way, somehow, someday, God will redeem the pain and suffering. And we raise that shield of faith. And we say, devil, you're a liar. And I'm resisting you. That temptation to run or, or believe that, that God's no good or, or to become bitter or angry, those are flaming darts that come often under the guise of suffering. And we go, yes, but I know God. <laughs> I can't see it, but I know it's true. And we hang on. God will redeem it. So let's think a minute or two. I like the word ponder. You know, it just sounds good. Do we really believe that we're in a war? I mean, really, if we, if we thought about it, you know, if we would have lived in England or, or Berlin in the, in the war when their bombs were dropping all of the time, would we live differently than, say, Kansas City in 2014? Oh, we might have, right? We might have had a different perspective of what it was like to live in a battle zone in war. We might have been more careful or more circumspect or maybe we would have used our time differently or whatever. But I don't believe I'm stretching the Scripture to say that you and I are in a war. I believe that principle is there throughout the New Testament. So what does that mean? What do we do with that as individuals? What do we do that as a young person or as an old person in here? What do we do with that? We at least need to think about it. We need to understand it a little bit. Well, you know, I don't believe the devil's real. I don't believe the devil's done anything to hurt anybody. I just think that's a bunch of nonsense. I just don't believe that those things happen nowadays. I've had those conversations with people. He's a defeated foe. He's toothless. Really? I know a lot of guys gummed to death. 
I know guys that have suffered severe gumming if he's toothless. Where they've chosen to listen to the lies and they've gone down to paths of destruction and they've been devoured. And ministries have been destroyed and families have been destroyed and generations have been impacted through gumming. <laughs> and I'm going, I don't know, folks. I don't know if we're going to agree on that point. <clears throat> the more important thing is that if you know somebody, if you've been around long enough and you've seen those kind of things happen, how did it happen? <laughs> we're to get our senses trained. We're, we're to grow in discernment. There are steps. There is a process of how we go down a path of destruction. And we would be wise and prudent to think about those things and say, you know, I don't want to go that way. Many of us in here with scars will talk to the young people in here and say, don't go, don't go there. You're going to get clobbered if you go over there. Oh, what do they know? They don't know what they're talking about. Let me show you my battle scars. Maybe that's why old people talk about their surgeries, right? Yeah. You know, they've been through the wars. They've been through the scars. And they're going, yeah, you know, don't go there. That thing, that'll kill you. Yeah. You know, you stand up and you say, yeah, don't marry an unbeliever in here. Young ladies, if so, I don't care if Prince Charming comes along and he's got the greatest white horse in the world. If he isn't a believer, pray for his salvation and walk away. Why would you say such things? Oh, I don't know. Maybe I spent the last 30 years dealing with it. Yeah. The people that didn't listen to that. And you've got the scars. Come on. Let's grow in discernment. Let's grow in obedience. Let's look at other people's wounds and injuries and say, how can we avoid that? How could we learn from that? How could, how could we change and be different? I think that's okay to do. How about this one? Is our faith firm? Is it firm? Maybe you're in the midst of suffering right now. Man, it's hard. I understand. It is hard. Suffering is never fun. <laughs> but if our faith is infirm, why not? Do we not know the Lord? Do we not know His Word? Do we not believe it? There's got to be an issue down there somewhere where we're saying, I'm struggling here. <laughs> God, help me. I want to grow. I want to mature. I want to be able to hold that shield of faith tighter, stronger. <laughs> help me, Lord. And if we don't ever stop and ask these questions, we're not going to find answers that are helpful. So if you're in the midst of something right now and your faith is wavering, why? What needs to change? Have we not made any time to get our minds renewed? Are we listening to deci deception and lies of the enemy? Somewhere there's some place where that shield's coming down and we're getting hammered. <laughs> you know, we need to put it back up. I know God. I know He'll redeem. I know He will do this. So think about those couple verses this week as you meditate on these things and chew on it throughout the week and see if there's any application where you live. Here's how I'm praying about this. Lord, I am so very grateful for Your Word that instructs us. Out of all of the things that You could have put in Your Word, You chose these things. And it's not an accident. It wasn't a mistake. You put your word together the way you desired to do so. And I thank you for it.